Oh, that's the part about managing expectations, right? Um, hi, I'm Arno. I have a software problem. Um, let me just shortly say a few words about me. I've, I'm a local boy here. I'm from Zurich. I've been to ETH, Google Zurich, and then I started founding companies, and that's the second one I'm now at, at Vision. Uh, we do DevOps. And then in my spare time, I like to do event networks. So for example, the Wi-Fi here, I, I built it last night. So I hope it works. Um, anyway, uh, my Twitter handle, I'll probably put on the slides, uh, tweet about it, and they probably be, will be online at some point, so uh, you can have a look at them later. So what, I, what, what is this talk about? What I'm going to talk about? So first, what is this DevOps thing, right? So it's like cloud, marketing, buzzword, um, bingo. Uh, I hope you all have your bingo sheets with you. Um, and the second thing is where, where is the security, right? I mean, how, how is this going to work? And then I brought two customer examples with me, so you can have a look how this all looks like. Um, then there's room for questions, I assume, but actually we just talked to Florian that um, if you have any questions or stuff you want to discuss um, when they pop up, please uh, raise your hand and wave and make yourself heard to Florian and you get a mic to ask them right away. I think that's maybe more a uh, you know, discussion thing. What is DevOps, right? Um, apart from all the marketing and buzzword thingy, um, let me introduce it to you and discuss it a little bit so we all on, are all, uh, on the same page. So DevOps, the word comes from development and operations, DevOps. And there's two core things that, um, that it entitles, which is Bring agile software engineering tools and processes to operations people. So stuff that software developers have been doing for, for decades, automation, testing, um, operations has been struggling with or has been adopting in the last maybe five years, but there's still much room for improvement. So automation, infrastructures, code, versioning, rollback, testing, continuous integration, testing and deployment for code, and for especially for the infrastructure as code. And on the other hand, there is a lot of op operations experience um, and try to bring that back to the developers. So um, for example, for scalability, the independent microservices, so if one part of an application or application stack falls over, not everything should be down. Um, and on the other hand, for production insight, uh, monitoring, logging metrics that uh, operations people use for their daily bread, right? Um, make that available to the developers as well to make them, um, to help them make informed decisions about the architecture, but also on the, on the development of their applications they're doing. And of course, together, it's make the, the guys who pay the bill, so the business owner, application owner, make them more happy and let them decide what to do. Let me go into do those things a bit more, more deeper. Um, the collaboration thing is probably one of the the, the new things, right? I mean, it's, it's the whole culture thing. Um, it's, there's been this, you know, uh, worked fine in dev and it's an ops problem now mentality. So there was a huge wall. Different teams, of course, also different um, know-how and different um, types of people, right? I mean, we have the creative developers, we have the 24-7 being up at night uh, operations people. And of course, there are different kinds of people and different teams. Um, and so that has been a, Mostly a communications problem, right? Um, it's also been a, a delegation from the uh, developers that they're not responsible for what their code, right? Because if it crashes at night, it's your operations people that have to wake up. And that's been a problem that's been, well, I call it, I say it's been escalating, but uh, it's been a problem that's been addressed by let the teams collaborate, uh, make common teams, put operations people together with software engineers in teams, and let them together handle the problems that arise. Um, agile operations engineering, um, it's, uh, let me come back to that later. Um, counter fear of change with automated testing. That means there's always going to be changes, right? Um, we heard it this morning in the opening talk. Um, you have to plan for changes, you have to plan for updates. And if you, you should feel comfortable doing them because then the barrier of changing stuff gets lower and lower, you feel more comfortable to do it more often. And that of course means smaller changes and that of course means less risk to break stuff. 
and put the developers in control, um, at least to some point, um, give them self-service tools um, that they can use and interact with, with the application when it's running. Um, so also to take the operations people maybe out of the critical path and enable the uh, developers to do their jobs, basically, right? Infrastructure as code, um, that what I was starting to tell before, changed from hand groom ser uh, servers to operations engineering. So basically, um, uh, instead of making servers by hand and configuring by hand or by sh short cell scripts, uh, treat it as an engineering problem, as a software engineering problem, and make or use readily available solutions um, to fix that. And of course, if you have that, if your servers are automatically set up like those, or almost, um, you gain speed and reliability. You humans make errors, that's normal. Um, if the servers are set up automatically, there's much less room for error. Um, you gain versioning and rollback, so basically you know, standard software engineering uh, benefits. Um, and of course, it needs to be automated so that the developers can do them themselves um, so, for example, uh, give each developer a full stack of the application, including databases and backends and caches and web servers and whatever that needs to run, um, so they can try out their code without breaking it into production. Um, <laughs> no manual changes in production. Duh. Um, so, if they wanted to have something changed in production, they change it in a tool that does all the um, operations engineering, you can test the change, you can roll it out to a testing environment, you can then roll it out controlled in production environment, and um, it's, uh, it's, you know, it's an engineering solution for that. And of course, if you can do it once in pr for production, you can do it as many times as you need for testing different branches, for uh, testing different versions, test testing different combinations, different migration scenario. Uh, that's the whole point of automating the infrastructure as well. There's a lot, a lot of tools. And there's a whole category of DevOps tools and SourceForge and uh, GitHub and, and you name it. Um, and DevOps has been also um, um, reduced to the tools that it uses, right? Um, there's more, there's the whole trust thing, there's the automation thing. But of course, the tools enable you to automate and you can reuse them and you don't have to do it all from scratch. So of course, uh, for uh, atomic deployment and rollback, you need some sort of packaging, right, that includes all the dependencies for the application you want to deploy. Uh, for example, we, we have been using uh, Debian packages and RPM packages, Red Hat packages, um, and now slowly moving into Docker. Um, so basically to have a consistent package of everything of the application, uh, all its dependencies, all the libraries, all the runtime environment as far as possible in one place so that you can um, so, so what you see and what you test is actually what you're going to get in production as well. Uh, infrastructure state management, configuration management also called. Um, there's different readily made tools available, Puppet, Salt, Chef, Ansible, you name it. Um, they do about the same thing um, and it's then again a matter of taste which one you want to choose. Continuous integration, testing, deployment. Um, the tools you've probably heard of, Jenkins, very popular uh, open source tool. Travis CI is a hosted solution, very well known for their free open source um, work they do. GitLab CI is a uh, tool integrated into GitLab Git management. I'll come to that later. And of course, Atlassian Bamboo from the Atlassian suite of tools um, help you to do that all. And then the self-service part, there's tools you can use for that. For example, Vagrant, um, which is a virtual machine and provisioning tool that uh, you can use to provision the testing environments, for example, for developers, so that then they just git pull a repository with the, the declaration of the test machine, and then they can instantiate as many of them as needed. Um, or through continuous deployment, so um, for example, through the Jenkins uh, tools, you can use them to auto-deploy stuff to a central environment, so you don't need to keep track or update or um, support, basically, the developers um, doing stuff on their own machines. Infrastructure testing. So, of course, the infrastructure tools you, you would use to, to build it up. Um, infrastructure testing is something as, as, as soon as you have it 
deployed or written in code. You can use the code quality um, tools to run on them and uh, make your own infrastructure code um, better. Um, so that's the bring software engineering best practices back to operations. Um, you have a lot of moving parts. If you have a you know, normal web application as we use it, has at least uh, one or two databases, some cache, some web servers, some application server, and they all need to be configured to talk to each other uh, with credentials and stuff. Um, so that's why we should be unit testing each of those components uh, separately, plus then the, the uh, instantiating one of those stacks so that they all know where the components are, service discovery works, um, so that uh, we, ca we can be sure that we don't do any regressions from the infrastructure side when changing something. Bas you know, basic software engineering um, process. Feedback. Um, once for, for developers, production is mostly a black box, right? They ship it and then it's, I don't know. Um, so they also bring self-service to uh, bring them the insight into what is actually happening and what they've been doing all day. Um, there's um, two things we, we do actively. One is them to uh, collect all the logs, especially application logs, um, but also web server logs, WAF logs. Um, so that the developers can actually see what's happening, and that of course helps them um, to search for a production error root causes, and giving them, uh, in this case, a web GUI where they can search for stuff and, and do their stuff. They usually would do um, on some single server SSHing in and then looking at log files, or I don't know. Um, that's much easier and much easier, and you can, or we sell them uh, that by the benefit of uh, not needing. To, to use go to the servers, especially if you have multiple servers, it's a pain. Um, and once they use it, we can uh, take away the, um, the root access to the production. Uh, so they, or any access, SSH access to the production, which again helps to the um, no changes in production policy, right? Nor manual changes in production policy. And the other value is it's all merged from the servers and indexed, and you can search and filter and stuff. So that's pretty. Uh, pretty cool. Uh, ELK, Elastic Logic Kibana, is one product. It's an uh, open source product. Um, there is also uh, Splunk, for example, a commercial product. It's very similar. So that's like the, the, the output, right? And then um, for that debugging output, maybe, and then for the whole um, what's happening in a more quantitative way, um, you can either get from the logs or collect separately uh, server and application metrics. Um, like New Relic does, for example, um, that's a software as a service that does that. Um, but you can also have it you know, hosted yourself with some InfluxDB um, time series database, for example, where you can both collect server metrics like CPU, RAM, disk, and so on and so forth, but also correlate them with application metrics, number of locked in users, number of sessions, number of hits, and that, that stuff that can uh, help you debug stuff um, when, when you have a problem, right? So in the end, we usually end up with a workflow like this. We have on the very left the developers, application owners, all the, the people that, that do stuff, right? Um, they work with version management, standards of the engineering. Um, in the same version management, we have configuration management. Um, configuration management then provides each developer feedback loop uh, with a development environment, whether that's a Docker container or Vagrant virtual machine. Uh, doesn't matter. Um, from the version management for both the code and the configuration management, there's continuous integration. Uh, continuous integration, basically, if it's a, uh, a programming language that needs to be compiled or built or somehow uh, aggregated, um, built in packaging. Um, and then there's uh, hopefully automated testing. <laughs> At least we can provide them the infrastructure to do automated testing that they still need to write to test themselves. And then, of course, given the feedback from the continuous integration via uh, chatbot, for example, to Slack or HipChat or whatever they use, uh, or to a dashboard or whatever, basically enabling them to, to, to work faster, right? And then uh, deploying all that um, to some testing, production, whatever servers they are, uh, built by configuration management, and then uh, deployed the application from continuous integration and deployment. That's basically it. And then, of course, there's the whole operations 
thing, right? It was the software engineering process, and then there's the whole operation stuff. So once it runs, there is need some databases and backends. They need to be created and, and supported. Of course, uh, for disaster recovery, you need some backups. Um, then once you provision a service, you need to make sure it actually runs. So do service monitoring and alerting, um, logging and metrics we already talked about. It's all the, it's all the op standard op uh, operation stuff, right? So when discussing with my colleagues, we were like, okay, so where's the security, right? There's no button called security, right? So that's maybe because it's all in there, right? I mean, the security is an integral part of the software development, deployment, and operations processes. And it's almost everywhere that security is involved on different layers and levels, of course. Um, so let's go through them uh, and, and discuss. And if you have input or, or opinions to share, please speak up. <laughs> Developers, duh. Um, that's probably a most white box testers do, right? They talk to developers, they look at code, they look at what libraries they use, where they're from, uh, what versions they're using, uh, did they think anything about what they're doing, um, do they use uh, libraries or do they implement crypto or SAML or you know, something by themselves, which they shouldn't, so that's on record. Um, education, 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 training, help, support, that's what they need, right? Because it doesn't matter how secure the deployment and operations process. If the software is shit, it doesn't matter, right? Um, and that's my, you know, um, word to you. Please do educate developers so that their software gets better and that it's, a, um, it's an incremental process that it gets better and better. Okay, that was the developer's part. Let's go to, you know, more technical and tools, engineering stuff. Um, configuration management was one of the issues and the infrastructure automation we discussed earlier. Um, the conversion management is uh, pretty cool in, in terms of the system security. Um, we, uh, any of the tools I mentioned earlier, basically you, you have a declarative way um, of uh, saying how you want the system to be. Um, and then the, the tool makes sure that the state is, uh, is what you defined earlier. So um, baseline system security is like a typical example. Um, which services, system services to enable or disable, uh, telnet, DAW, uh, SSH, DAW. Um, of course, the whole system users management. Um, users, groups, keys, hashes, sudoers ca can all make sure that uh, you declare which users are supposed to be there and which users are supposed to be absent, and the system makes sure that in 50 minutes at its latest, um, the system will converge to that state. And of course, you should monitor what it does and have it feed to the logging system, and when you detect that it does changes, that you didn't, you know, you didn't change something in the code, but it does changes, um, maybe something happened on the server, and you should have a closer look at it. You can set up, for example, the uh, AAA, so authentication, authorization, and accounting, for example, with Active Directory or LDAP or whatever the tool the customer uses um, for the rest of the users, right, that should have, for example, SSH access or some other access. Um, of course, that access doesn't work if the system is offline, and that's why we still need to have some system users um, to, to log in and fix stuff um, if the system is offline. And then there's uh, you know host firewall, for example, IP tables on uh, on Linux systems or PF or what, whatever your uh, software choice is, um, you can make sure that it's pretty tight and locked down and that it will be and stay like that. Another topic is logging. I mentioned the ELK stack before. Um, audit logging is a, is a big thing, right? I mean, the DevOps uh, mentality of enabling the developers to change stuff, of course, doesn't mean that they have like a, a free game of, of doing anything, right? Um, they have some certain processes they can do, for example, a deployment process or a quality assurance process or whatever they you know, are allowed to do. And accounting uh, um, makes sure that it's, it's a valid developer and so on and so forth. Um, but of course, it needs to be logged. It needs to be timestamped who did what when, uh, what was changed exactly, so that uh, it's, uh, it's, and there's an audit trail to figure out what happened actually. 
Um, we feed application request logs, basically uh, the many logs as we can find, um, or as the customer should have access to, um, and we make it as, as write once, read many uh, as possible, uh, or as feasible for the customer. So basically, it's read only for, for normal users, so that we have some kind of, yeah, and I'm not going to call it tamper proof, right? But at least some sort of tamper evidence here that it's only for restricted admin access to change the logs. And of course, we can also export them to some real write once medium um, if the customer requires that. And the ELK stack I introduced earlier already, uh, here also just for reference. Service monitoring, I mean, typical operations problem. Also, well, there's a security aspect in that. I mean, all the, that the services are available, yeah, okay. Availability, it's a security thing. But of course, there's so many layers to, to monitor on, right? I've started at the top layer, uh, application layer, but of course, there's all the transport layer stuff that uh, automated monitoring can, can take care of, like uh, uh, checking the SSL uh, certificates and protocols and ciphers and poodle attacks and so on and so forth. Um, so we can, from a monitoring perspective, make sure that the systems are up to date, um, the system parameters like utilization or stuff uh, isn't exceeding uh, some limits. And we also do check for updates and backup in and through the monitoring to have a complete picture of a system and also to give the customer access to that monitoring and uh, see what the state is actually of his application. Backup, typical disaster recovery problem, right? Um, Again, as write once, read many as possible. Um, the, that's also, you know, if, if there was a compromise, to, of course, be able to roll back to a known good state, but also to figure out what actually was changed and uh, have there some tamper evidence of the application or application server. If something happens, um, we don't want the backup to be changed later, um, except, of course, if it needs to be purged or, or something, uh, if the customer decides to do that he doesn't need it anymore. Uh, we do the backup uh, so that the servers are enrolled automatically by configuration management. Uh, that helps by um, their, their, all the servers are by default backed up. There are no, no orphan servers that are, oh, I don't know where it went. Um, and of course, we can, when it's automated, we can make sure that the backup target is not in the same data center or cloud provider um, or infrastructure where it needs to be. Um, so we can you know, cross, oh, do offsite backups automatically. And then we want to have the data encrypted both at, uh, at rest at, and at, uh, in motion. Um, and as I mentioned before, we monitor that as well. Version management, uh, we talked about it earlier. Uh, software engineering, basic principles, right? Uh, we use Git nowadays. Uh, you all probably know Subversion or uh, CVS before that, um, both for the customer code and for all the configuration management code and config. Config is uh, parameters like credentials, stuff like that. It's all in a repository, of course, with probably with more tighter restrictions on, uh, on who can access that. Um, audit lock mentioned before. Um, there's a different services you can use, for example, for Git. Um, there's shared ones uh, we can buy a software for ser as a service. GitHub is the most known. Uh, Bitbucket and GitLab.com or others. Uh, there's a ton of services for that. And of course, if you want to have it internal for either uh, political, company political reasons, or if you don't want to be down when GitHub is down, um, there's uh, different products you can buy. So basically, uh, and actually GitLab is free, you don't have to buy it, um, that you can use yourself um, on premise or wherever your application is, is sitting. Again, um, authentication authorization through uh, some central database. Um, and since all dev developers have offline copies and no credentials in the code, please. Or you will show up in uh, hackmagitab.com. What was it called, the site? No, anyway. Continuous integration. Um, if you didn't know what that was, it's trigger, build, package, test, and deploy on each commit. Um, we usually have the target of the commit, and uh, sorry, target of the deploy, uh, selectable by branch, uh, repository, and tag. So you can say, okay, uh, everybody can commit to a certain uh, branch, but of course, it's not the production branch 
that only certain or closest group uh, of people have access to. Uh, manual promote of production releases is a standard uh, continuous deployment uh, feature like Jenkins has, that um, all the other tools have as well. Um, and uh, the only thing that we need to take care of is where to put the completed build and package artifacts, right? Because if you can, uh, if you can upload your own ready-made code um, to the um, artifactory, Docker registry, or um, Debian or RPM registry, of course, you can own the application just by uploading your own valid-looking um, package there. So that one needs to be pretty tight. Um, of course, it's much easier when it's automated from the uh, from the code part, and the, assuming the code part is secure, um, that one doesn't need any manual access, so it can be pretty locked down. Um, feedback to status, and authentication, of course, central again. Okay, so what kind of automated testing, and why is that secu re security relevant, right? Um, it's both... Uh, Security as in availability problem, of course. If a uh, developer uploads um, code that's not syntax uh, conform conformant, uh, you're going to have a bad time, especially for inter interpreted languages. Um, uh, so, of course, when, when you do that, you can also check for a coding style um, and do some static code analysis to find some obvious bugs. Uh, that is pretty, well, I call it low maintenance, right? Because it's, it's, you set it up once and you, can, you have some low-hanging fruit get uh, from there. Um, but then, of course, uh, unit tests, uh, assuming that software developers are good at the trade, they have some uh, unit tests that actually fire uh, if and only if there's a problem with, uh, with changing the code. And then, if available and if there's budget and time, uh, functional tests, so basically do a test deployment of the whole application with each commit or at least of each tagged release and um, check that, um, and that can go just checking whether, they're, whether it runs, or go deeper, like make um, uh, test requests and check that the answer actually matches what you, what you have in your test data database. Um, there, we were thinking about maybe also implementing some security checks on the functional level. So, for example, for each tech release, uh, automatically run uh, uh, common scanners like Nikto or SQL map against the uh, deployed application. And then, of course, there's going to be a huge you know, list of output. But, I mean, what, what could be feasible there is to have a... Um, to have a, of course, when you do a regular pen test or at least an inspection of the software, um, you know, declare uh, an output of one of those tools as, as okay or acceptable, and then where, when there's changes to that, so if there's new stuff popping up, then alert um, the, uh, the, the developers that, okay, now you changed something that actually is very visible to scanners outside, maybe you should have a look at that, and okay, if it's really okay. Databases and backends. Uh, now we're going maybe a little bit away from the uh, from the uh, software engineering problems. Um, there's a, a ton of different um, uh, backends and, and other ready-made software, um, standard software that that the applications need and depend on. Um, there's a lot and lot of open, uh, unsecured, unpatched versions of those up out in the internet. Um, Shodan is your friend. Um, Redis, I think, was the last one to be pretty wide open and uh, unauthenticated access and stuff. But of course, all the others have had their had their problems as well. Um, so it's really, really important to have an up-to-date um, uh, configuration management template for them that basically provides them with the same config, um, which usually is not the default config. Um, and then you can add all the clustering, credential management, firewall config, backup config, monitoring config to that template. And so each time you need a whatever, MySQL service or whatever, uh, it's set up the right way. And if you change the template once, you can actually uh, update all the instances that you're using um, if there's a problem or you need to deactivate or activate some, some sort of uh, attribute for them. And 
moving up the stack from the backends to the to your application service, the, um, it's, it's basically the same thing, right? Um, there's a ton of different environments. Of course, we as a you know, more service provider oriented people, we have a, a lot of different uh, ones. Uh, if you only have one application, then usually you only need to focus on one of those. Um, but then again, we've been seeing that uh, when when companies move to microservice architectures, that means that each team has their own small code base of whatever part of the application they're implementing. Um, some of them actually are allowed to choose their own programming language, for example, or framework, for example. Um, and so then again, you already start having multiple different environments of whatever Java and Python and Ruby and whatnot um, there's going to be around. So there again, the templating can make sense. Um, to uh, hide some of that complexity and uh, um, security relevancy in there. And also for completeness, um, the 12-factor app um, manifesto, who, who knows it? Who has heard about it? About 15%, 20% max. Um, so that's, uh, um, that's the... Well, no, microservice. That's the operations experience uh, system architecture um, uh, manifesto um, that uh, that's been very popular. Um, please have a look at it. It's it, it's very it's there's different stuff. You know, make sure that you don't uh, don't have side effects. Make sure that your application is uh, deployable uh, atomically. All that kind of stuff. And one of the uh, pretty cool things that it proposes is that. Uh, instead of hard coding credentials in code, instead of uh, providing them in a config file that you need to put somewhere, um, or in an uh, application uh, when you start it from the command line in some sort of uh, uh, argument where you can see it when you run PS, um, for example, provide them as uh, environment variables, like for example Docker does, um, because then um, there you can start with each invocation of an application, you can start it with different endpoints for the, um, for the backends, and that of course helps you a lot if you have to deploy multiple times for testing and de development and production and, and whatnot. Have a look at that if you haven't already. And then of course, in addition to all the web, uh, application servers, there's a ton of uh, stuff around that, um, uh, web servers, cache servers, uh, mod security, Thanks, Christian, for the talk this morning. Um, uh, HA proxy, then all kinds of VPN stuff, OpenVPN being maybe the most popular. Uh, I've mentioned uh, IP tables before, and then all the failover stuff that's needed to, uh, if something goes down, like Pacemaker or Keep Alive D. Um, that's, of course, all, all our components that you usually need in once or tw twice or thrice somewhere, and that's uh, much easier if it's automated. So let me make, you know, have an example for you so that's something to, to look at. Um, no, customer case one is a, um, we, we call it a big hosting, right? Uh, it's basically PHP MySQL um, with multiple different PHP versions and they have a cache server varnish and then they have a ton of backends that in, in addition to MySQL, Memcached, Redis, Solar and Elasticsearch for, for all the indexing. Um, then they use um, application deployment with uh, Ansible, um, and actually the only user that does that is the Jenkins user that uh, uh, then deploy uses uh, Ansible as a better cluster SSH um, to deploy them to all the application servers to the same code base. Uh, the, the, the other st stuff is managed by Puppet in that case. Um, Basically, so that Puppet maintains the state and Ansible is used to do updates or changes or anything that's an, an interrupt, basically. Uh, in addition to all of that, then there's a, a, a Docker image for local testing. Um, probably at some point it's feasible that it might be used for production as well, but a Docker image is much more lightweight than to pull a whole image of a Vagrant virtual box down to each developer's disk um, so they've opted to, to use that. And so let me show you a small system diagram. I have no idea whether you guys in the back can actually read that, but uh, well, there, there's empty seats in the front. Um, so that case is a, is a multi-tier architecture. We have uh, some front-end web server for SSL um, and Warnish for caching. And then the Warnish does load balancing over um, some 
uh, application servers. I think the biggest cluster they have, it's about five application servers at the time. Um, and then that each application server has an Nginx web server again, um, which then feeds the requests to the PHP FPM, which the customer then can choose themselves in a YAML file, uh, whether it's version 5.6 or 7. Um, they have some standard libraries like GIP, New Relic, and stuff, and then feed both the web server logs from, uh, from the app server, of course, from the front end as well, um, plus then the old application logs to a central um, uh, ELK, is a Logstash server, so that uh, they can give developers access, access to that. And then for all the backends, there is a MySQL MariaDB cluster, um, which is local ends via max scale DB proxy. Then they have some uh, Redis, some Solar, and then for files, they use a redundant NFS setup, um, basically, so that um, they have at least uh, a failover. And so this, this setup is then deployed all over the world in that case. They have stuff in Switzerland, South Africa, China, um, and the US. Um, so that's a, a pretty, pretty standard setup that they can now instantiate as many times as they actually need. Another case that's, uh, that <laughs> has been taking a lot of our time uh, is, a, is an OpenGIF platform as a service. OpenGIF, uh, as you might know, is an is a open source project from Red Hat. Of course, there's also an enterprise version of it um, that internally uses Kubernetes, um, uh, the Google open source tool that, again, manages um, the different Docker uh, containers. And um, it's 100% open source, so you can download it yourself and run it on your laptop if you want to. But you can also have uh, enterprise support if you want to have that as a production backup. Uh, we, we do it uh, for uh, Puyo.ch, that's a switch, Swiss platform as a service, um, and we're uh, also building it uh, in the EU and the US uh, on AWS, actually. Um, enterprise on-premise is probably something that's going to be happening as well, so um, that's, that's the whole point of automating this setup, right? Um, just a short uh, intro, what is OpenShift and how does it work, or what does it do? Um, OpenShift, as I mentioned, um, is the, the wrapper around the Kubernetes and Docker thingy. So basically, it maps part of the workflow that we saw earlier uh, into, whole, into the whole Docker thing. Um, so basically, you have a, a, a Git repository with, uh, with your code. Um, the Git repository can notify OpenShift uh, API for each commit. And then um, the OpenShift basically takes the code, takes an empty container, and uh, makes a release out of that, um, that put it in a, maybe you won't see it, but it's a forklift there. You can zoom in uh, when you have the uh, PDF. And then chips the, the container, um, gives the, con the, the container to Kubernetes, and then Kubernetes manages the Docker containers, as in deploys a new, ver deploys a new version, um, uh, those rolling deployments, so uh, deploys a one new version, kills one old version, deploys the second new version, kills another new version, and so you can have up upgrades and updates without, um, without any downtime, if it all works. If it doesn't, then it rolls back. So that's just a short intro, what is OpenShift and how it all fits together in this, in this pipeline. Any questions? Uh, that's the marketing slide. Um, that's basically it, so I'm very open to discuss further. Testing. Okay. Yay. So you brought up uh, an interesting problem, which is uh, secrets management, and one of the solutions being the environmental variables. I'm wondering um, if you could comment about some other alternatives, such as uh, secrets management servers, such as Vault, yep. et cetera, for, for DevOps. Yeah, we were thinking, well, we were thinking of uh, using Vault as the backend to manage the secrets, actually. Um, so Vault is a soft piece of software, if you don't know it, that uh, basically is a very locked down a small application that has a RESTful API where you can request a credential and then if your certificate matches and if you're allowed to and so on and so forth, gives you back a credential. And for certain services, you can even generate uh, credentials on the fly so that you have you know, key rollover and all those kinds of processes integrated to that. Um, the problem with, with, 
Vault in, as an example or other ma uh, systems is it needs a uh, change in the application. So the application needs to go and request a credential for the MySQL service or whatever. So if you're able to do that, then it's no problem. Then Vault is just yet another backend basically for your application. And then it's just as, uh, as secure as possible or as locked down as possible, um, uh, another, another backend basically. If that doesn't work or to, um, to do the service discovery, where is the Vault service API? You need to input that um, by some means. Um, there, the environment variable is a very, uh, very quick and painless way. Does it answer your question? So you, concerning security, you showed a lot of measures you've integrated in uh, the whole life cycle. Prevention measures, other measures like backups and logs for afterwards if something happens. But what kind of measures do you have to get alarmed of a security breach or something? There's, um, there's, well, excellent questions, and I mean that's the uh, that's the, the the pain of being in the uh, in the defense side, right? Uh, I mean we have lots of logs, we have lots of stuff that we um, try to filter out of the logs. If he, if something changes but nobody committed something, that's a, that's a sign. Um, there is a lot of uh, host IPS, uh, tripwire, uh, all those kind of stuff. Um, there is stuff that we can try to do, like uh, do the application code, if it's an inter inter interpreted language, uh, read only, like Docker does, for example. Uh, that again, if somebody still tries to access or write stuff, then we can be alerted. There is, there is all that of those kind of stuff, and we try to feed them into either the logging or the metric side, and then uh, configure the monitoring to alert, alert stuff. Thank you. Um, have you had a look at uh, tools that you can plug into the continuous integration cycle to make it easier to test for security vulnerabilities? For example, I'm thinking like um, OWASP dependency check to check for library dependencies, or I'm thinking about um, continuous security frameworks like Gauntlet or BDD security. Do you have any comments on uh, these kinds of tools? I personally not use them. Um, Thinking about them, I wouldn't remember any of our customers requesting uh, integration of such a tool uh, into the continuous um, integration process where we manage the process for them. If they manage them themselves, it might be that I don't know. Um, that's why I'm speaking here to uh, get the discussion rolling in what are there, what tools and measures do you use for um, both black box and white box testing that would be suitable for continuously uh, applying over and over again to detect changing stuff as early as possible. What is your strategy for incident response assuming your machines were breached for forensics, let's say? That's a whole lot of talk. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've got the 10 minute warning already. Um, let's discuss this at the beer, okay? Uh, thank you, Arno, for a very comprehensive talk. What I like about uh, your talk was not only mentioning mod security, of course, <laughs> but uh, I think Vision is a company which is really walking the talk. So you're really doing DevOps, and we've seen this in a very nice way in your talk. All the different aspects which you have covered. Uh, the question I have is, being a DevOps company, we have seen your Elk stack, and we know if I manage to inject anything into your system, it will certainly end up in a lock. And if I can make sure that one of your operation people or anybody do, as everybody's a, a DevOps guy at your company, if I get you to look at this request, I have a, per a perfect log injection attack vector into your browser. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, so if you access uh, um, you get, if you get an XSS through the logging into, into the, through the buff, into the logging to the uh, logging framework front end, and uh, it gets executed, um, you're going to have a bad time. Um, that's why... Are you going to have a bad time? Yeah, we all are going to have a bad time. <laughs> I'll have fun time. Well, that's true, yeah. 
um, that's, a, that's a real problem, and that's why uh, uh, Kibana, the, the um, how do you call it, like JavaScript application that uh, then queries the Logstash, uh, sorry, the Elasticsearch uh, API, um, was recently acquired by Elasticsearch, the company, um, also to be able to, you know, insource that kind of responsibility. And um, knowing a few people from Elasticsearch, the company, I hope they have their uh, application security in check, and since it's open source, you're all very, very welcome to uh, have a look at the code and uh, propose uh, changes should they be necessary. Uh, you mentioned uh, automated unit tests, um, do you, but you didn't mention tools, so you, you've mentioned several other tools for like orch orchestration automation. Yep. Um, do you use any, and do you, do you prefer any? Um, we, as well, as we mostly use a uh, uh, for example, um, configuration management tools, there's specific tools for the different languages. Um, there is, uh, for example, server spec and vspec, pspec, uh, something spec, but basically where you can test for, for uh, is the file there, does it contain the string, and, and that kind of you know, server stuff, is the port open, mm -hmm. those kind of stuff, so do continuous integration for the configuration management and system state. Uh, yeah, I more meant automated security. On the software. Yeah. On the, uh, uh, so there's two tools that we recommend a lot. Um, one of them, they're, they're both free. <laughs> uh, Gauntlet is on GitHub, it's G-A-U-N-T-L-T. -T. It's a, a bevy of automated free open source security tests. Yep. But, but more importantly, you can call any tests that you want for unit test. And number two is uh, Breakman that Twitter made. It's mostly for Ruby environments, but it's automated okay. testing. Uh, and third, I guess, is um, do you know about rugged software and rugged DevOps? Because we're growing a tribe of speakers and your content would be very good for that. About what, sorry? It's you... called rugged software oh. or rugged DevOps. There's okay. basically one day tracks at developer conferences versus security conferences <laughs> where we're giving them good tool chains like yours. Yep. Okay. Cool, thanks for the input. I think we have time for one last question. No, no. We don't, apparently. Or there is no no other question. Any oh. other questions? Time for one more. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>